In this episode, Luke Jacobs of InCamp joins me to discuss the intersection of environmental health and safety and ESG. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode. And today I'm thrilled to have with me Luke Jacobs. Luke, first of all, uh, welcome. And thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Tom. I'm excited for the conversation together. Luke, could you tell us a little bit about your academic background? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my background actually is in environmental science and biogeochemical research. So I uh, really came up thinking about earth systems models and really kind of in the nitty gritty details of ecosystem modeling and thinking about uh, kind of carbon sequestration and landscapes. And then uh, over my career, I've moved into really more industrial compliance and thinking about uh, how organizations can actually do their part in complying with environmental regulations and also being good stewards. What's your current role, Luke? Yeah, so uh, I'm currently the co-founder and CEO at a tech company called NCAMP that I run. Uh, we're about five and a half years old, have about uh, 80 people on staff, uh, and we work with about 250 companies across the United States uh, to manage compliance in about Right now, I think about 18 and a half thousand uh, facilities located in the U.S. What led you to uh, co-found or be one of the founders of InCamp? Yeah, it's a it's kind of an interesting, I'd say, story of bringing together a few different pieces of my background and then my co-founder's background. So uh, after my time in academia, I went into environmental consulting for a period. And while I was in that role, one of the things I kept noticing was the lack of technology available to actually complete a lot of the environmental compliance work. I saw a lot of safety uh, technology incident tracking, but really when I was digging into kind of what was available for the environmental professionals of the world, I didn't see a lot that really got kind of down to the fundamental uh, data level needs and uh, reporting needs that really my job was to actually, you know, provide for my clients more manually. Uh, and then my two co-founders actually, uh, one of them has a background in computer science and the other is kind of a quintessential startup person, did a NASA research fellowship, but then went into kind of high growth startups and had been working around a variety of companies. So I think it was really the combination of really fundamentally understanding some of the business challenges that companies were facing. And I was really deep in the problem itself as a consultant and then really having a network around me that was also very plugged into how technology startups kind of worked, how you think about getting them started. So uh, really a couple of years of sort of brewing in that uh, idea space with uh, with these folks together just gave me the confidence really and the desire to dive in and, and try to start something. And I would say just a, enough uh, willingness to take some risks uh, is important when you go and kind of uh, do strike out on your own. But that was something that uh, I was definitely interested and willing to do. Luke, uh, one of the things, themes I picked up in doing a little research on yourself in InCamp was that many EHS professionals have to deal with complexity. Mm -hmm. And I come from a corporate world with a much different background, but it's that's the same challenge. And so I wanted to ask you how you help EHS professionals deal with that or those who may be in the greater sustainability world as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think importantly to think about how we actually help our our customers really is to understand the complexity of the problem that they face and i like to think about this as really a combinatorial problem so you've got a federal standard but then each state and even each county or municipality can have their own additional nuances layered on which then when you're the environmental professional you're dealing with not only multiple regulations, but then how those regulations play out in all of the jurisdictions that you operate in. Um, so really the approach we take at NCAMP is we're a modern software platform that provides our users a uh, really a database and a tool to track all of their regulated facilities that they have and map information about them, such as where they're located, what regulatory IDs they have, or what regulations are they applicable under, and then really building out a integrated tasking system so they can ensure that once they know what needs to actually be accomplished for their environmental program, they have the visibility 
to actually assign out all of those tasks to their teams, ensure that they're actually getting completed. And then really a, a component of our uh, application and our company and how we help uh, businesses is that once you've actually determined what you need to comply with and you're collecting the right data, you still have a lot of actual work to do all of the submissions to all of the different places and regulators that might need that information. Uh, and this is something I saw really as a consultant, and it's been one of the the kind of guiding principles we've taken in our product development to actually build the technology to allow for submissions to any agency that you need to get data to for different reports that we build into. Uh, a little bit like TurboTax for different environmental reports, I'd say is kind of like a, a high level way to think about it. Um, and I think that that really helps streamline really the the complexity by really quantifying what you've got, giving visibility to our customers. And then I think something we think about a lot is really using technology to do and augment really jobs that environmental professionals need to do, but maybe are not the highest leverage for them. So copy pasting tons of data into reporting portals is not actually unlocking, say, your sustainability goals for an organization. And something we hear with our customer base actually quite a lot is that the time that they free up by automating components of their compliance data tracking and reporting process is actually then redirected into their sustainability goals as a corporation and really digging in on more emerging regulations and strategic topics as well. Uh, so on some levels, it helps them understand what they need to comply with, manage that process, and then actually be in compliance. And we provide technology that allows that to be done a lot more ro robustly and then efficiently, which frees up time to dive into any of the other hundreds of tasks that uh, environmental teams are getting tasked with every day. And that really led into my next series of questions because uh, you talked about reporting. Can those mm -hmm. same strategies be used uh, literally to report up meaning inside of a corporation all the way to a board of directors so that should they want to take a deep dive, they can, but that whoever is reporting to the board, whether it be a head of ESG, head of sustainability, or perhaps even an EHS professional, uh, they can give that overview with the backup documentation if requested. Absolutely. And that's something that uh, a lot of our customers use to really ensure that they have good underlying data about hazardous materials, they have waste that's being produced in their organization, and then being able to aggregate that and really analyze it all the way up to the highest levels. Um, I think it's actually something that we're seeing a lot that is emerging where if you think about EHS and ESG, the overlap between those two fields really is the E, it's the environmental component. And one of the things that we're seeing is really, I think, an emerging uh, kind of value driver in businesses that EHS teams are actually tapping into is that the data they're working with is often actually some of the most useful data for your ESG as well, particularly for the sustainability side, because you really have the underlying metrics on what is happening at your locations from an environmental standpoint, what emissions are going out, what waste is being produced, uh, which really is a, a bottoms up uh, analysis that is, I think, being opened up and explored more and more by organizations, particularly as they take a little bit more digital uh, oversight of aggregating that data in a way that can really be analyzed. Because I would say just a pervasive blocker in the space for, as far as I can tell, EHS, ESG, really the whole thing is that data is fractured and siloed and often set up in various spreadsheets, various systems. And it's quite a lot of uh, work and even system design you would need to go through to assemble the data that you even need for your organization. And then ESG gets down the whole rabbit hole of, you know, your entire supply chain and being able to get data across, you know, a larger body of organizations to really calculate your full profile. Uh, but I do think that the environmental teams and organizations actually have, uh, frankly, a real opportunity to, to increase their value that they can drive into the broader uh, ESG profile for a business and initiatives going on. I just have one small point of disagreement with you because oh, I see H&S directly in the S of ESG. Yes. And yeah. so that really the EHS professional and the EHS professional may say, no, Tom, and it's also G as well uh, mm -hmm. because you've got a, a document and you've got to measure it and then you've got to 
uh, monitor it and then remediate as an appropriate. And that to me is a G function as well. So I really see the EHS professional as a, a key part of any ESG solution, but I completely agree with you uh, about the siloed nature of data. And what I try to explain why I think ESG is so powerful is you finally have one person or one set of people perhaps looking at a company in a holistic way and yeah. looking at it in a way that, yes, we have to report certain statistics and numbers, but more importantly, we have the opportunity now to have greater business efficiency across our organization because somebody is finally looking at that. So uh, I really uh, appreciate the process approach that you've described, and I think you're spot on uh, as well. Let me ask you, what is tier two reporting and how do you help companies with that, whatever tier two reporting might be? Yeah, absolutely. And I also think uh, I think your previous point is actually one well taken as well. Just thinking about ESG is a it's a, a broad initiative. And I do think actually, yeah, the social and governance component from the health and safety side is a, a really interesting component as well. Um, specifically to your your last question with tier two. So uh, tier two reporting is known by many different names. Uh, Sarah Title three your emergency planning community right to no act report. Basically, these are all the same thing, which is a set of regulations that are actually spawned from chemical plant uh, explosions, starting with uh, one in India in the 80s, actually, the Bipol chemical plant and the West Texas fertilizer uh, explosion in, I believe, 2013 was another moment where this actually got strengthened. But essentially, it's a set of regulations that uh, mandates for organizations that hold hazardous materials over reporting quantities that are set by a federal, but then also lower jurisdictional standards. Some states have lower thresholds and even some cities have lower thresholds of, for instance, sulfuric acid. If you have it on site, you need to be able to quantify how much do I have? Where is it located? How am I storing it? Do I understand if I have a safety data sheet? Is that available to anyone who might come into contact with it? A lot of data about really your material inventories needs to get collected, aggregated, and then reported each year. Uh, and we submit those to really three primary bodies within different states, which is the State Emergency Response Commission, uh, which is a state level. Each state has a CERC. Uh, they're called then each county has a local emergency planning committee, which also needs a copy of reports for any locations with these materials in their county. And then the fire department that is closest actually gets a copy as well, because a lot of this ultimately comes down to if you're a first responder and there's, say, a, a fire in a warehouse and you're going to respond to it, you pull the tier two report to understand, OK, in the northwest side of the facility, there is a bunch of anhydrous. We need to make sure that we're aware of that, because if it you know, if a fire gets to it, could actually react, explode, much larger, you know, risk. Um, so broadly, this is a report filed by uh, really hundreds of thousands, probably up to about a million facilities in the U.S. each year. That's tracking things from kind of a granular level down to like forklift batteries, the lead, the sulfuric acid, uh, lithium ion setups that run a lot of these you know, batteries, man lifts, forklifts, stuff like that, uh, all the way through major oil terminals, uh, you know, any sort of like giant storage, uh, you know, containment area that you see anything with a berm, uh, all of that's going to actually need to get a tier two report each year. Uh, and then if you do bring on certain uh, types of chemicals, basically, that are uh, extremely hazardous in nature, the EPA has a list of extremely hazardous substances. Uh, and if you bring one of those onto your site, technically, you're supposed to file within 60 days to you know, same set of, you know, regulators, the CERC, the LEPC and the fire department that you now have this on site as well. So uh, it's really a, a report that's trying to make sure that anyone in the community knows what could actually pose a hazard in an, an emergency disaster response scenario from locations that are, you know, in their in their general area. So it's kind of a, a big mouthful, but I would say it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like you got to tell people what hazards you have, where they are, and what you should do if there's something that goes wrong at the site. So let me ask you about uh, your advocacy for an end-to-end -end waste reporting solution and a yeah. cradle-to-grave hazardous waste uh, mm -hmm. system. Can you kind of walk us through the process behind uh, one or both of those? Yeah, absolutely. So we're really excited about our waste application, and we really deal with uh, – 
facilities bound by Resource Conservation and Recovery Act regulations, which pretty much catches any site that's producing any amount of hazardous waste throughout the year. And with our end-to-end -end system, I would say the, the kind of status quo is a pretty fractured system where you might not actually know comprehensively how much waste you're producing across your entire organization at any given moment. It's all being done kind of at a site level, and there are lots of requirements that uh, people need to track in terms of uh, understanding what waste they have. Do they have a lab analytical? Are they confident that they've got the right container needs to be stored in the right place, then you need to have the correct type of vendor who can pick up your waste. So like a waste management or a public services, they're you know equipped to be able to pick up hazardous waste. And then you really need to manage the almost logistics of where that waste is from really the moment it's produced all the way through the moment you actually ultimately dispose of it in a number of different manners that may be available to you. You can incinerate it maybe you often would have to actually just dispose of it in a you know treatment storage disposal facility that's equipped for hazardous waste um and really with this our end-to-end -end system more or less helps companies understand at each site in real time what waste are they producing at that location and then we also integrate with the waste vendors and haulers themselves who are actually taking shipments off site for these companies and make sure those books basically match every month. So you know what waste you produced across all your different waste streams, how much of it you know, did you create at each site? How did you get it off site? Uh, how are you disposing of it? And then basically all of that data then is also required for uh, ultimately compliance reporting. But I'd say, especially for thinking about sustainability, it's a critical component of waste minimization efforts, pollution prevention, because you can really dig in on where are you producing your most waste in what processes uh and making sure that you're actually logging all of that correctly for all your sites uh you know both in kind of the short term to make sure that they're compliant and then more strategically to be able to understand are there opportunities to actually decrease your waste production overall by say figuring out if you could recycle any of the products that you're producing and disposing of as waste uh, this is something that I think is a lot of opportunities uh, for organizations to dig on. on. Uh, let me focus on that word opportunity, because yeah. as I understand it, you see compliance with the RCRA and the EPCRA is actually business opportunities. Could you explain how you see compliance or perhaps InCamp sees compliance as really a business opportunity? Yeah, I think there's a couple different ways to actually think about it. So you've got really the, I'd say, broadly, the need to actually comply with the regulations is a business cost. And so an opportunity really is increasing the efficiency of your ability to comply with those regulations. And then I'd say particularly as far as implementing a systematic solution that allows for businesses to actually have an ongoing process, allows for long-term business continuity and risk mitigation on really missing missing required compliance events because of turnover, because of lack of visibility, uh, and then ultimately having to pay the cost of potentially stoppage time at locations and really, you know, all of the negative press that could come about from having some sort of known violation. So I do think part of this is actually turning what is kind of viewed as a cost of doing business right now, which is, you know, maintaining compliance with your environmental regulations and using systems and technology to actually unlock efficiencies in that so that you're not only able to comply with all those regulations more easily and more quickly, but you can actually serve the business more effectively as well. Some of our largest customers, uh, they're launching new sites, they're opening up new locations all the time and being able to really enable the business to do that quickly while also maintaining the risk profile that they want with all of their environmental compliance needs uh, allows them to move faster and ultimately uh, seize more market opportunity without sort of being slowed down by uh, antiquated process or you know ultimately just not actually being able to get the work done to ensure that they've got everything lined up to get new locations online um so i think that's a a big opportunity just broadly to increase efficiency because I would say it's a it's a pretty inefficient process in a lot of organizations. Uh, and then as far as ESG, I do think organizations that uh, have goals that are tied to broader sustainability, waste minimization, increasing their ESG metrics, uh, 
do really have the opportunity to mine into some of their environmental data to find opportunities to actually decrease their waste, increase their recycling or their process efficiency so they actually can save money literally on not buying new product and using, say, waste oil uh, as a lubricant in other process. This is a you know, actually pretty common, especially in the oil and gas industry. There's lots of different methods to actually minimize that waste and instead get use out of it. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, tie it into your broader sustainability goals, I think, as a, an organization, as public markets continue to actually push that direction, I think it uh, is a benefit to businesses actually to really be able to leverage that data to, to increase their ESG efforts and ultimately drive shareholder value with their stock price and their business continuity and sustainability over time. I have to say that's one of the best justifications of ESG I have ever heard. <laughs> well I'm, done. Well, thank uh, you. Thank you. So where do you see your speciality uh, and really even in compliance down the road? And I'm going to something I don't want to say, but 2030, i.e. mid-century. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, uh, it's kind of, kind of a crazy thought, right? We're uh, <laughs> moving right along. Uh I think really where we're going and our goal really is to build a unified data layer that really sits between regulated organizations and regulatory bodies so that it makes it really easy to have one, I'd say unified data model and almost operating system of environmental data so that you know what you need to actually be collecting and the information collected is contextualized and reported on based on your geography. Um, I think this is actually a place where, as I look at the next five to 10 years, we're really watching ESG actually closely because I would say we're building some of the underlying kind of filing capabilities that as ESG regulations continue to emerge and sort of solidify, uh, I think we will actually begin exploring ways to more uh, holistically tackle the reporting problem within ESG as well. Um, but currently kind of the next five years, really, we're tackling hazardous chemicals, hazardous waste. We'll be moving into Clean Water Act, uh, Clean Air Act, and then a number of just adjacent environmental uh, reporting needs, basically, that are more bespoke or state level. Uh, and then long term, moving international. We serve a lot of companies that are multinational. Uh, they're operating all over the world. We really focus on U.S. compliance right now, but it's a known uh, area for us to build into that our, our customer base is definitely interested in uh, and just adds more uh, to your kind of earlier point. More complexity really as you add additional jurisdictions and just spread out the, uh, the geography that a system really can uh, you know, have kind of the index of all the required rules that increases non-linearly as you add more and more locations, which is something where uh, it's not an instantaneous process. But over the next seven years, I think uh, it will be building that out. And I, I would say like in a very lofty goal, we'd love our system to be able to wherever you are on the planet, load in your facility information and know based on where you're at and a bunch of underlying information about your location every reg that you need to apply for and uh, comply with under environmental rules for any local jurisdiction, then be able to actually support those submissions. So a uh, lot to do, you know, we've got, got many, many more things to keep building here at NCAMP, but uh, we're excited about it. Have a great team. Well, Luke, unfortunately we are near the end of our time for this episode, but before we leave, I wanted to ask you if listeners wanted any more information on yourself in camp or really any of the topics we've touched on today, what would be the best place or places for them to go? Yeah, uh, great question, Tom. Uh, you can find the company generally at ncamp.com. We're also on LinkedIn. And then my email is luke at ncamp.com. Keep it really simple. Uh, and I keep a pretty close eye on it. So if any listeners want to reach out, share any ideas they have, or ask any questions, would be happy to engage with them on those conversations as well. Uh, and then we're on the usual social media, uh, you know, LinkedIn's our main one, but Facebook, Twitter, I think we've got one, but not super active on it. Well, Luke, thanks again. And I hope we can continue this conversation. Absolutely. Tom, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the award-winning ESG report. I hope you'll join us again in a couple of weeks for our next episode where we have Christine Marie. <laughs>